Thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring Future Hindsight. For 10% off your first month, go to betterhelp.com slash hopeful. Start living a better life today. Also, check out the Democracy Works podcast. Each episode examines a different aspect of what it means to live in a democracy. New episodes are released every Monday. Find Democracy Works wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome to Future Hindsight, a podcast that takes big ideas about civic life and democracy and turns them into action items for you and me. I'm Mila Atmos. A couple of months ago, a video of a restaurant delivery guy dragging his e-bike through several feet of water in Brooklyn went viral. He was out as New York City was inundated with flash floods. I try to do my part by tipping generously, and I know I'm not alone. But in reality, the whole structure behind tipped work is the problem for restaurant workers, nail salon technicians, delivery drivers, and many others. Basically, tipped work violates the social contract because it enables businesses to shirk their responsibilities to their employees and instead puts you and me on the hook for ensuring the workers get paid. The pandemic exposed the inequitable architecture of restaurant work and many other service jobs, and it's also accelerated a shift in the workforce. Millions have disappeared from the labor market, and the great resignation is here. A year and a half into COVID, workers in a range of industries across the country have started strikes closing factories, halting businesses, and leading some to call this past month Striketober. So I'm wondering, are we witnessing a change to the terms of the social contract when it comes to jobs and work? It's long overdue. Low-wage work is a huge driver of inequality in the United States. So what would a new social compact look like for folks like that restaurant delivery guy in the storm and other tip workers? I'm joined today by Saru Jayaraman. She's the president of One Fair Wage and director of the Food Labor Research Center at University of California, Berkeley. Her new book is One Fair Wage, Ending Sub-Minimum Pay in America. Thank you for joining us. Hi, thanks for having me. Would you explain for us the connection between tipped work and the trifecta of gender, race, and class? How do these things fit together? Right. Well, I think that question really needs to take us back in time. And I, you know, I don't think people know the history of this industry in this country. You know, tipping as a practice originated in feudal Europe. It was something that aristocrats and nobles gave to serfs and vassals, but always on top of a wage, never instead of a wage, always on top of a wage. It was intended as a bonus or an extra for a job well done. Uh, And that idea came to the States around the 1850s when rich Americans started traveling to Europe and coming back and trying to show off that they knew the rules of Europe. And America initially resoundingly rejected tipping as a vestige of feudalism. We don't buy into those aristocratic notions where democracy, everybody should get good service regardless of how much you can afford to tip and employers should pay workers, not customers. But in 1853, something happened In 1853, waiters in major cities in the U.S. who were mostly men and mostly white at the time went on strike for higher wages. They got a full wage up until 1853. They went on strike for higher wages. And in response, restaurants in major cities in the U.S. replaced these men with women in order to be able to pay them a lot less. And then 12 years later, emancipation happened. And in emancipation, restaurants found an even cheaper source of labor. They wanted to hire black people who were newly freed and not pay them anything at all and have them live entirely on tips. In many instances in this time during Jim Crow post-emancipation, black people were charged for the privilege of having a position in which they could get white people's tips as a shoe shiner or a restaurant worker or working on these luxury Pullman trains that went across the country. And 
We started with a full wage for waiters. We went down to a zero dollar wage as women and black people entered the industry. And so that is the origin of the subminimum wage for tipped workers that, you know, speed up 150 years later is now $2.13 an hour. Thus, you cannot understand the subminimum wage for tipped workers as anything other than a devaluation of black lives and women's work because the wage literally went down to zero as women and black people entered the industry. And now you see this subminimum wage now spreading across so many other sectors, right? You've got the subminimum wage for incarcerated workers. That's another legacy of slavery. You've got the subminimum wage for workers with disabilities. Gig workers receive the equivalent of a subminimum wage because after you take out what they're paid, you know, you might pay $50 for an Uber ride and the driver gets 12. Well, of that 12, he or she is paying half of that towards car costs and gas. And so they end up with less than a minimum wage. In many cases, these companies have been known to discount these workers' payments by how much they get tipped, which is an emulation of what restaurants have been doing since emancipation. And so you're seeing this idea of getting away with not paying people and letting customers pay them with their tips spreading across the economy. And I've got to tell you, Apple Pay actually has made this a lot worse because you are now seeing the request to tip in environments where we never used to tip before. I walked into a flower shop the other day. The owner turns the screen around and it says, how much do you want to tip? And we would never tip in a flower shop after buying flowers, or we'd never tip in a coffee shop buying a bottle of water. And now you're asked how much you want to tip. And we have seen employers in some instances say, oh, now you're getting tipped through Apple Pay. I can pay you less. I can pay you a subminimum wage. And so if we don't end this subminimum wage For all workers, we're going to see it continue to grow and fester. And what workers in this moment are saying is that we just won't put up with it anymore. We refuse to work for these wages. And if the restaurant industry has reached this massive staffing crisis where they genuinely cannot fully reopen because these workers are refusing to work for these wages, all other sectors need to stand up and pay attention. This is the end of subminimum wages. This is the beginning of the end of subminimum wages in the United States of America. That's really a powerful statement. Your book also talks about disparities among subminimum wage workers and not just in the restaurant industry. Would you tell us what you found? Yeah, we had been doing studies for years showing that because of implicit bias in tipping on the part of we the customers and also because of racial segregation, women of color being in more casual restaurants, white men being in more fine dining restaurants, that women of color earned $5 an hour on average less than white men, even when they worked in the same restaurants. And that was even bigger in New York. Places like New York and Boston, we saw an $8 per hour differential between black women and white men. So there was already this huge disparity that just got so much worse with the pandemic. With the pandemic, you saw millions of these workers actually unable to access unemployment insurance. And it it wasn't just immigrants who couldn't access unemployment insurance due to status. It was lots of tipped workers earning a sub-minimum wage who were told, your wages are too low to qualify for benefits. And then going back to work and finding during the pandemic that tips were way down because sales were down and health risks and hostility and sexual harassment were way up with thousands of women reporting that when they had gone back to work, they were asked repeatedly, take off your mask so I can see how cute you are before I decide how much to tip you. And as a result, just reaching a breaking point, saying this this was bad enough prior to the pandemic. Now it's an issue of life and death and I'm leaving. And so workers have left this industry in the millions. And so I wanted to highlight that this is bad across the board, that there's a massive exodus from the industry. It's become a matter of life and death. And most so for women of color and Black women in particular. Thanks for clarifying this, because I think a lot of people are asking themselves, why is it that millions of American workers are staying home right now and why we're seeing so many labor actions at the same time? What I'm hearing from you is that it's not because the stimulus was too generous or that unemployment was more profitable than going to work. In fact, many tip workers did not qualify for unemployment insurance benefits. Yeah, it's and it's the incredible irony and 
frankly, outrage of the right and frankly, some Democrats as well saying, oh, these workers are so lazy. They're staying home collecting unemployment insurance. That's why they don't want to go back to work. It's so hilarious, truly, because, you know, when the pandemic shutdown happened, six million restaurant workers lost their jobs. That was one in four Americans that lost their jobs was in the restaurant industry. And we started a relief fund for these workers. About 250,000 workers applied to us for relief. Two thirds of the service workers, and they were from all 50 states, two thirds of these workers reported that they either couldn't get unemployment insurance or they faced great challenges getting unemployment insurance because they were told in too many states, it looks like you just earned that sub minimum wage of two or three or four dollars. And so, in all of those states where they're earning two, three, four, even five dollars an hour, the state says, looks like you're earning too little. To qualify for benefits, your boss never reported your tips. I'll give an example. There was a woman from Michigan, Sarah May, who said, I religiously reported my tips. She worked at a small bar in a small town in upstate Michigan. She's a mom. She lost her job like everybody else did. And when she went to apply, the state said, looks like your boss never reported your tips. And so it looked to the state like she earned that sub-minimum wage of $3.52 in the state of Michigan. And they said, looks like you didn't work enough hours. You didn't earn enough money over a two-week pay period to qualify for benefits. Maybe you're working less than part-time because you earned so little. And so then she said, okay, couldn't get state benefits for that reason. Then she applied for the federal unemployment insurance because it was touted as a program that was intended for all workers regardless of their income. But the problem was that when she was told she was eligible for those benefits, but they came through the state system and the state had already marked her as a denial. And so she couldn't get federal benefits either. And so Sarah May is a white worker in upstate Michigan. She's not an undocumented immigrant who couldn't get unemployment insurance. She was one of millions of American workers who, after working for decades in the service sector, found at the end of it, you're SOL, you know, out of luck. You have no option. You can't get benefits, even though you've been working as many hours as all your fellow workers who are now getting benefits. You cannot get them because of the structure of pay in your industry. It was an epiphany for a lot of workers. A lot of workers in that moment had like a light bulb moment, like, wait a second, if the state is telling me I earn too little to qualify for benefits, probably I earn too little. And I should never have put up with my employer paying me two or three dollars and expecting me to live off of tips. It was never right. I always should have gotten a wage like every other worker in every other industry. So how do you address the roots of this problem? How can we fix this? Yeah, I mean, I think we are at the precipice of massive, massive change. Comes back to your notion of the social contract. Because workers had been for generations toiling away, putting in their time, working like every other worker. And when the government said to them, sorry, you don't get benefits, even though others do, for them, that was a rupturing of the social contract. Wait a second, you told me for years, if I, if I worked hard, if I did what you're asking me to do, I worked hard, I put up with the low wages, I put up with the abuse, I put up with the harassment, you told me that I would be okay, that I would be taken care of, that I'd be able to take care of my family. But the instant my job is lost for no fault of mine, but due to a global pandemic, you're telling me I'm totally out of, luck, that I have no recourse, no options. For so many workers, it revealed for them what was problematic with the social contract to begin with, which was that supposedly I work for you, restaurant company. The social contract is therefore you pay for the value of my labor. But it was never the case. They were not paying for the value of the labor since emancipation, which is essentially what the notion of slavery is. I get free labor. And so the employers say, I shouldn't have to pay for your wages. Customers should have to pay. That was already a rupturing of the social contract. And what workers are saying now is that they're done with that. Unless employers are willing to do their part and pay that full minimum wage with tips on top, workers are not going to be willing to work. And I've got to say, I've been so moved and impressed with the way independent restaurants have responded to this. You know, 
as it was last year, when restaurants were closed and the murder of George Floyd happened, we heard from hundreds of restaurants around the country who said, it's time for me to rethink my business model and it's time for me to move away from something that's a direct legacy of slavery and a source of inequity for people of color, as I described at the beginning of the interview. And so it's time to move towards one fair wage. And our numbers have exploded of independent restaurants. We call them high road restaurants that are paying livable wages and want to do the right thing. We've most recently tracked nearly 3,000 restaurants in 41 states that pay a subminimum wage, including Georgia and Louisiana and Alabama and Mississippi, that are now paying a median wage of 1350 plus tips. These are states where these employers were allowed to pay $2, are still allowed to pay $2.13 an hour, but they're paying 13, 14, 15. In states like New York and Massachusetts and Illinois, we are tracking restaurants paying 15, 20, 25. We've even found some restaurants paying $50 an hour plus tips to get workers to come back to work. And it is a massive shift, huge upheaval, and frankly, indication that this can be done. For so many generations, the Restaurant Association has said it can't be done. It can't be done. We'll go out of business. Even though we have demonstrated year after year after year that the seven states that got rid of this system many decades ago, that's California, Oregon, Washington, Nevada, Minnesota, Montana, and Alaska all require a full minimum wage for all service workers with tips on top. These seven states, the data shows, have higher restaurant industry sales per capita, higher job growth in the restaurant industry, higher small business growth rates than the 43 states with a subminimum wage, higher tipping averages, and one half the rate of sexual harassment in the industry. Why? Because this workforce that is overwhelmingly women in these seven states has never had to put up with as much harassment from customers because they're not as completely dependent on the tips. They get tips. In fact, they get more tips than the workers in the other states. But they're not so entirely dependent on the tips that they have to put up with anything and everything from the customers. So it was always possible, even though the Restaurant Association kept saying it's not possible, it was always possible, and the seven states proved it. Now thousands of restaurants across the country paying this in response to the staffing crisis are showing that, of course, it's possible. Of course, it's not only possible, but it's better for the bottom line when you pay people a livable wage. Guess what they do? They stay with you. There's far less turnover. There's better employee morale. There's better productivity. You get better food and better service. And really important for small business restaurants, they go out in the community and they spend it. They eat out. In fact, the CFO of Denny's admitted this early in February. He was caught red-handed because Denny's was part of the National Restaurant Association telling Congress that a $15 wage plus tips would kill the business. All jobs would be lost. In the same moment in February, he was caught in a shareholder meeting telling shareholders actually paying $15 plus tips in California has allowed Denny's to grow faster in California than any state in the United States of America. Why? Because consumer spending is higher when you pay these restaurant workers more. They are such a huge part of the population of consumers that when they get paid more, they get paid a full minimum wage, they take their families out to eat. And it helps the business. Right. It's so obvious and yet counterintuitive to a lot of people. We're going to pause for a quick word about our sponsor. When we come back, Saru is going to talk to us about how America's workers are standing up for better conditions. But first, I want to tell you about BetterHelp, the world's largest therapy service. What's great about them is that you can start communicating with a counselor in under 48 hours and without ever having to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room. Also, BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. That's a pretty seamless way to get started. Of course, anything you share is confidential. BetterHelp is available for clients worldwide. It's convenient, professional, and affordable. Start living a happier life today. Get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash hopeful. Join over 1 million people who've taken charge of their mental health. That's betterhelp.com slash hopeful for 10% off your first month. Thanks, BetterHelp. 
I also want to encourage you to listen to one of our sister podcasts called Democracy Works. For many of us, the events of the last few years have shaken our faith in the strength of American democracy. Future Hindsight is part of the Democracy Group, and the Democracy Works podcast is too. Host Jenna Spinelli and the folks at the McCourtney Institute for Democracy at Penn State put it out every Monday. Each episode examines a different aspect of what it means to live in a democracy from immigration to impeachment and from conspiracies to climate change. They're educational and insightful, a perfect companion to the perspectives on future hindsight. My favorite recent episode is a conversation with Danielle Allen on achieving democracy's ideals. I'm a longtime listener, and I think you'll enjoy this show. Find Democracy Works wherever you get your podcasts. More now with our guest, Saru J. Raman, president of One Fair Wage. You know, you spoke about the seven states that don't have a subminimum wage. Can you explain to me the role that states and cities have had or can have and should have in creating these changes for workers? Absolutely. You know, sadly, the National Restaurant Association, we call it the other NRA, because it's so powerful that most people don't know about it. They've heard of the Rifle Association, but the Restaurant Association is as powerful. It has had a stranglehold over Congress and both parties for generations, really, since its founding in 1911. It has wielded enormous power. And um, as a result, Congress has repeatedly left out tipped workers and other subminimum wage workers every time they've raised the minimum wage. The last time the tip minimum wage went up was 1991. And so, of course, it's critical for states because so many cities have lost the ability to pass these laws locally because of Republicans who have passed laws at the state level saying cities don't have any power to do this. So cities have lost the power and it really comes down to the states. And we've seen states and localities take action. Obviously, these seven states rejected this legacy of slavery 40 or 50 years ago, many of them, and have been paying workers a full minimum wage for a long time. And now the new governor of New York, Governor Hochul, coming in on the heels of a sexual harassment crisis in New York, she says, I'm a former tipped worker during the pandemic. She came out very publicly in support of ending the subminimum wage for tipped workers. And we're very hopeful that she's going to do just that through executive action in the next few months. In D.C., there's a ballot measure moving on the ballot to end the subminimum wage for tipped workers. And we've documented over 125 restaurants in D.C. already paying 15 plus tips. So there's much less opposition than there was in the past to, to just move in this direction now. And there are bills moving in Massachusetts and Illinois and Maine and many other states because the crisis has gotten so bad for workers that are leaving the industry, and that has resulted in a crisis for everybody else, we've not only been documenting these 3,000 restaurants now paying 15, 20, 25, we've also been talking to them. And what they've been saying is we cannot do this alone. We need policy at the state and federal level to end the subminimum wage for tipped workers so that it, it's a level playing field. So it's not like we're paying 15 and Denny still gets to pay $2 an hour. We need everybody to go up at the same time. That's how people are going to be able to revitalize the economy and, and let us pay these higher wages, one. But the second reason they're saying they need policy to back them up they need the government to back them up, is that they're saying, here I am, little independent restaurant owner, I'm willing to pay 15 to get my workers to come back to work, but I got to tell you that even when I pay the higher wage, workers still are hesitant to come back because they're not dumb, and they know this could be temporary. There's been so much talk of temporary hiring bonuses. Unless the government makes this the law, there's no other way to send a signal to millions of workers, this is permanent wage increases. It's worth coming back to work in restaurants. Without that, what workers are telling us is that I love this industry. I love working in the service sector, but I actually can't afford to work in restaurants. It costs me more in childcare and transportation to get to work than I get when I get there, which means I'm negative and I just can't live like this anymore. So it sounds like you're talking about the Raise the Wage Act. Tell us about what that is and why does it matter so much now? The Raise the Wage Act has been around for several years. It's a federal bill 
that calls to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour and phase out the subminimum wage for both tipped workers and workers with disabilities. And it has been moving through Congress. The House has passed it now twice, um, once in 2019 and again this year. Um, it's the Senate where obviously Republicans have been in many cases, philosophically opposed even to the idea of a minimum wage. Some of them think there should be no minimum wage at all. But even among Senate Democrats who now hold this razor thin majority, there are not many, there are about eight actually, to be precise, Senate Democrats who have voted no on the Raise the Wage Act. Most of them are saying it's because the Restaurant Association does not want them to end the subminimum wage for tipped workers. In fact, Senator Cinema and Senator Manchin headlined the National Restaurant Association's conference earlier this year, keynoting and saying, don't worry, we won't let the tipped workers get to 100% of the wage. And so these are the Senate Democrats that we need to focus on because in total, Democrats need to understand that the reason they were given the majority is because so many millions of restaurant workers and service workers in Michigan and Pennsylvania and then in the runoff election in Georgia, they voted for this party believing that they would deliver a raise the wage act, a $15 wage, that they would go up from two to 15 and they are not going to be happy come November 22 if it's not delivered for them. So I I, I got to give it to to President Biden, he actually has prioritized this bill. He made it part of his campaign platform. He made it part of his COVID bill even before Inauguration Day. He has been pushing this issue in a July CNN town hall. Restaurant owner got up and said, I don't have enough workers. What are you going to do for me? He said, well, you got to raise your wages. He said, my sister-in-law is a tipped worker in Atlantic City. She earns 7 or $8 an hour plus tips, but people don't want to work for that anymore. They want $15 an hour plus tips. So he's been very clear. We need Senate Democrats to align with the president's agenda and frankly, open your eyes to the reality of the industry right now, which is that the industry is not going to be able to fully reopen or recover without these workers being willing to work and without paying them a full wage. I do just want to share two important data points One is that we did a survey in May of 3,000 workers across the country that still work in restaurants. 54%, that's more than half, said they're probably leaving the industry. 80%, 8 in 10, said the only thing that would make them stay or come back to work in restaurants is a full livable wage with tips on top. Then we said, okay, Republicans are saying, or some Democrats even are saying, it's because they're lazy staying home collecting unemployment insurance. We said, okay, let's look at the states that prematurely cut unemployment insurance. We took five states that prematurely cut unemployment insurance and asked workers in those states the same question. Well, in those states, nearly 60% of workers said they're leaving the industry and over 80% said the only thing that would make me stay or come back is a full livable wage with tips on top. So it is not just a silly idea that these workers are staying home collecting unemployment insurance. It has been an ineffective policy to get them to come back to work thinking cutting their benefits is going to, because they never got the benefits to begin with, one. And two, the workers are saying it's not the benefits. All those other issues are important. Child care is important. Health care is important. COVID is, is dangerous. But my top issue, my top issue is the fact that I'm paid 2 and $3 an hour and I just won't do it anymore. It really is about dignity and being able to survive and thrive. It just can't be about, you know, merely scraping by. So in your book, you shared the success of the Make the Road New Jersey campaign for teenage workers. And I think this might be something very hopeful to talk about because they were successful. Can you tell us about how that movement came about and how they pulled it off? Absolutely. And I do want to just mention that the book really is the first time anybody has brought together all the different sub-minimum wage workers in the U.S. There's definitely restaurant workers, but there's also nail salon workers, car wash workers, parking attendants, the wheelchair attendants in the airports, the sky caps. All of those folks are tipped workers, but then you've got gig workers who, as we talked about, have the equivalent of a sub-minimum wage. In some instances, they're payments are being cut by how much we're tipping them. Then you've got incarcerated workers who get a subminimum wage because of the exception to the 13th Amendment that allows for slavery in the case of incarceration. And I'm living in a state that is, I think, a prime example of how we all should be so ashamed of this. We've been experiencing horrible wildfires in California. A third of our firefighting 
workforce is incarcerated people paid a dollar a day to fight fires and risk their lives. It's disgusting. And then there's the subminimum wage for workers with disabilities, also an outrageous subminimum wage reflection of people's ability. And lastly, the subminimum wage for youth. And the book really, across these different subminimum wages, attempts to say all of these subminimum wages are reflections of America's valuation of some people as worth less than others, subhuman. Youth, people with disabilities, the many immigrants who make up the gig sector, the women and particularly women of color who make up the tipped sector, the black and brown people who are disproportionately incarcerated. These are the people who America is valuing at sub-minimum wages, as subhuman wages. Two of these are direct legacy of slavery. In the case of youth workers, this is one of many examples we've seen of success in ending subminimum wages. In New Jersey, a group of young people who are part of Make the Road, which is a fabulous organization in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, organized to say young people should not get a subminimum wage in New Jersey, um, made a huge deal of it, collected thousands of petitions around the state, you know, projected their stories onto the sides of malls with big projections and finally got the governor of New Jersey to sit down with them and listen to why young people should not get a subminimum wage and won an end to subminimum wages in New Jersey. That's a really positive story. The part that I didn't mention is that there's still a subminimum wage for tipped workers and incarcerated workers and workers with disabilities in New Jersey. So we are making progress right now. We're seeing the end of many of these subminimum wages. The subminimum wage for workers with disabilities was just ended in California. And in Illinois, the governor just put forward an executive order that he will not contract with businesses that pay a subminimum wage to workers with disabilities. We are seeing advancements on so many different fronts. Gig workers just won a huge victory in New York City. So we are seeing so many advancements on so many issues across these subminimum wage sectors. But what we are trying to say is that we're all, we're all connected. Hopefully we learned that from the pandemic. And until there is no more thing as a subminimum wage in the US and everybody gets a full, fair, livable wage with tips on top. We can't stop because after all, what is the idea of a minimum wage? Again, coming back to that notion of a social contract. If supposedly in this country, when you work, you get a minimum wage, that was the social contract we established as part of the New Deal. What is the point of having so many people getting less than the minimum wage? Isn't the notion of a minimum wage that there's nothing less? That's the word minimum. <laughs> and so uh, that, I think we're heading towards that future, but we do have a lot of work to do to get there. Yeah, for sure. We have a lot of work to do. And it's a good point that you bring up about the firefighters and the nail salon workers and skycaps and all of these pockets of our society where the labor is exploited because they're seen as less valuable. And so, so many of which we called essential just, what, six months ago. We called them essential. And supposedly essential means that we will pay them what they need because they are essential. We, we, we rely on them. But essential became, frankly, known among workers as a dirty word. Essential is people who are disposable and will treat them like crap. So if they are essential, then we need to be paying them what they need to live. Totally agree. So what are two things uh, that people who aren't in the restaurant industry can do? And where can people find restaurants that participate in the High Road Kitchens program? Thank you for asking that. It'd be great if people go to the website, onefairwage.site or .com or .org. It all takes you to the same place, One Fair Wage, and click on Take Action. And there it allows you to do a couple of things. One, you can contact your senator and let them know we need to raise the wage and end all sum minimum wages in the U.S., Two, it does actually give you the list of restaurants that have now transitioned to a full minimum wage with tips on top. We want you to go to those restaurants and tell them, I'm here because you're now paying a higher wage. I want you to keep it this way, and I want you to join the fight to tell Congress that they need to make it a level playing field through policy. But we also want you to eat at other restaurants that aren't paying that so you can communicate to other restaurants, I'm a paying customer, I want to keep coming here, but I want to see you doing what a lot of other restaurants are doing now, which is paying a full minimum wage with tips on top. Well said. So you've dedicated your life to transforming labor conditions in the U.S., which is truly an enormous undertaking. So. Looking into the future, 
What makes you hopeful and what keeps you going? I have never been more hopeful than this year. <laughs> um, you know, first there was the potential for it to pass at the federal level. And there still is that potential as long as, you know, we have the bill and Democrats still have both houses of Congress and the presidency, there still is the potential to do this. So we are hopeful about that. But my gosh, what is so extraordinary, and we just have to acknowledge the courage, is just how many workers are saying enough is enough and walking away. That is the most incredibly hopeful thing coming out of this pandemic. And the fact that restaurants are responding by raising their wages, it's almost like the industry is saying, you know what? Whether or not you get your act together, Congress, we're going to change our industry. We're going to make it a better place for people to work. And they can't do it alone. Ultimately, Congress does need to follow. But it's like the workers and the employers are leading the way and the elected officials need to, to listen and to follow. So I am so hopeful that we're going to see change, you know, maybe first at the state level and then at the federal level. But it is going to happen because it's already happening. What keeps me going is that I have two girls uh, now ages 9 and 11. They're getting older every day. And I am sure, just like so many other young people, that they will work in the restaurant industry. In fact, I hope they do in high school or college. And, but by the time they work in restaurants, I really hope and pray that we've ended some minimum wages, that we've addressed race and gender inequities, that we've addressed sexual harassment. They are young girls who are black and brown. And it's so critical to me that they are treated with dignity and respect when they work in restaurants and that all young women like them and young men and people that work in this industry are treated with dignity and respect. And I think we're on our way there. Hear, hear. Thank you so much for joining us on Future Hindsight. Saru Jayaraman is the president of One Fair Wage and director of the Food Labor Research Center at University of California, Berkeley. Her new book is One Fair Wage, Ending Sub-Minimum Pay in America. Thank you. Next time on Future Hindsight, I'll be joined by Eduardo Porter. He's a New York Times journalist and author of American Poison, How Racial Hostility Destroyed Our Promise. He's going to share some of the many ways racial animus undermines the social contract and also going to help us think through how civic engagement could reset America's social compact so it works for more people. That's next time on Future Hindsight. This podcast was produced for Future Hindsight by Sarah Birmingham, Reva Goldberg, Zoe Sullivan, and Bart Warshaw of the Cocoon Collective. Zach Travis is our associate producer. Until next time, stay engaged. This podcast is part of the Democracy Group.